All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of A Sip of Knowledge with Marty Duffy, Liz Rhodes, and Lou Bryson. Plus, this week, special guest Frank McCarty, who brings decades of experience in multiple categories of whiskey, uh, which I will let your hosts give you a more formal introduction to in just a moment. Um, real quick, before I turn things over, I'm Will Hookinga from Zavi.co. Just want to point out a couple of ways you can interact with our hosts throughout the presentation. Uh, if you want to say hello, if you have questions, um, there's a chat box to the right. Feel free to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you do have a question at any point, you'll see a little button uh, near the middle bottom part of your screen that says ask a question. You can put your question in there. I will be keeping an eye on those throughout and sending them over to our hosts. Um, last but not least, please feel free to invite your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top right, which will let you do that easily. Uh, but with that said, Marty, Liz, Lou, I will turn things over to you now. Why, thanks there, Will. You are like the son I've never had. <laughs> I appreciate that. That means a lot. Thank, God. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> and kind of like one of the nephews I did have. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to a sip of knowledge. Drink deep today. Um, uh, my name is Martin Duffy. I'm a former senior master of whiskey from Diageo. Need I say more? Um, and also uh, two glorious years as a national brand ambassador for Benedictine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. They still make this stuff? Um, <laughs> and eight years as the um, uh, co-producer of the Chicago Independent Spirit Expo, but for the last six years, six years now, I have been the North American brand representative for Glencairn Crystal. Uh, Frank? All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all cues. He's all the way in Scotland, so there's a time delay, I think. <laughs> all right. Um, a lizard? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Really excited to have Frank on. So thank you so much, Frank, for, for joining no in on no share some knowledge with us. Um, I'm Liz Rhodes, technical distiller and spirit consultant. Have just over a decade of experience in alcoholic beverage. Um, most of my career was spent at Diageo, uh, but now I am founder and principal at Spirit Safe Consulting. And if you wanna learn a little bit more about what I'm doing in my consulting firm, there's actually a link in the about the host section um, to my website. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Lou. Thank you, Liz. Um, thank you all for being here, um, especially Frank and uh, and my and my two wonderful co-hosts. Um, I'm Lou Bryson. I'm a uh, I'm a whiskey and uh, and beer writer. I have um, my latest book, Whiskey Masterclass, is out. Um, talking about how to uh, thank you, thank you guys. <laughs> I'll get you one, Frank. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, it's all about uh, flavor and aroma creation and whiskey. And of course, my well-known tasting whiskey uh, from about four years ago. Oh, God, no, about six years ago. Um, a, a wonderful book yet. Um, actually, yeah, I didn't do a lot of tasting yet. So sorry, I'm blathering. Um, I was also the managing editor of Whiskey Advocate magazine for 20 years. And I am now a uh, senior drinks writer with... Um, Daily Beast, which uh, just won an award as uh, best um, That's right. spirits and cocktail That's publication right. at Tales of the Cocktail. We're pretty pretty pumped awesome. about that. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. that's all I got. We're gonna have some uh, some great conversation today. We were already warming up in the sound check this morning. Uh, we'll have some good stories there. We'll try and uh, recreate that because there was some great stuff there. <laughs> um, Marty. Introduce our guest. All right. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, by the way, uh, Frank could just speed read your book. Since he knows it all. It's like, know it, know it. Yeah, been there. Done it, yeah. <laughs> well done. Uh, the man we have today, our guest today, is a man who has uh, been at the business almost as long, well, no, yeah, almost as long as I've been alive, and I'm 96 years old. Um, so he has been at it. You can tell. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I wear it well, a little. Um, he's worked over uh, throughout Scotland and, and even over in Ireland. And yet his, his reach goes even beyond that. Uh, he has inspired distillers over here in the U.S. in the new world, 
as you might refer to it. Um, so, um, uh, everybody, I want to introduce you to Frank McCarty. Give him a round of applause. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, Frank, Christina uh, Wolf uh, says, long time not seen. Good to yes, see you. Yes, I saw that. You look like you're in excellent form. Scott yeah. Talon says, hey, Frank, looking good. Yeah. Monique Houston yeah. says, yeah. Frank is ageless. And um, uh, let's see, Herbert Hoover says, uh, I haven't seen you since my presidency. <laughs> <laughs> I had nothing to do with the dam. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, it starts I, already. I mean, your, your history does go back to the 1960s. Um, yes. Yeah. As far as uh, your involvement in whiskey, can you take us on a wee journey uh, through w what got you into it and all the places you have you have ventured? Have you got three hours? Yeah. Well, yeah, where are you, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just play the show for us here. <laughs> <laughs> three hours that we'd have to speed the whole thing up and replay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, if, if you want the, the history, if you like, you know, um, I started at Invergordon Distillery, Grain Distillery in the north of Scotland. Started there in March 1963. And I was only 18 at that time, you know, young fella. So I needed to get money, obviously. So I got a job at the distillery. And I always say to people that one of the, the reasons that I got the job is my father, he was personnel manager of Invergordon Distillers. He's laughing, <laughs> laughing. So it's uh, ne nepotism, nepotism's a great thing, you know. <laughs> so I'm caught there. Now at that time, I wasn't really interested in whiskey. Absolutely, and apart from drinking it, I had no interest whatsoever. All I wanted to do was make money. And at 18 years old, you go out at the weekend or any time and spend that money. Sometimes in things you shouldn't spend it on. But that was the only reason was to get a job which would pay me so I could enjoy myself, right? So in 1966, my father wanted to get rid of me because I was staying at home at that time. And he was fed up with us going out all night and coming home in the morning, etc. So well, spending all that money, <laughs> spending all the money. So about a year before 1965, Tom Nabulin or Tom Nabulin Distillery in Glenlivet was founded. It was built. It opened up. So my father shifted me down to Tom Navulin Distillery, where I got a job there. Stayed in Tom and Tull. I don't know if anybody's been in Tom and Tull. If you've been in Scotland, you have to go to Tom and Tull. Anyway, I lived there. I worked at Tom Navulin, and that's where the real interest started. Because at Tom Navulin, you did everything. I mean, I was taken on as a mashman, and then you did distilling. You did just everything, warehousing, the lot. You know, you just did everything. So that created a great interest. Apart from that, there was a certain sherry hogshead in a far corner of the warehouse where the spirit was filled into a celebration cream sherry hogshead. And even at three years old, it was bloody good. <laughs> there, was bit, there was a bit of that went on in these days. You know, it, uh, it was a dumb thing. I mean, you, you help yourself a little to whiskey. And at that time, there was a great thing about dramming, if you know what dramming is. I mean, the guys used to come in at eight o'clock in the morning, go up to the brewer's office, where there's basically a charge on the brewer, and he would line you up and he would produce this bottle of clear spirit, which at that time was 11.2 overproof, which is about what else? 11.2 overproof, 63% alcohol. So he'd pour out a good half a Glencairn glass. It wasn't Glencairn glasses at that time, sorry. Half a Glencairn <laughs> And this was dished out to anybody that wanted it. So they, first thing in the morning, down the hatch and went and did their work. And at lunchtime, you went back to the brewer's office and you got another one. You know, same thing again. Five o'clock, you got another one. And then you drove home the seven miles to Tom and Tower or whatever. And in between all these drams, you could also have another dram if you did a dirty job. You know, so some of these guys were going home and they'd be pretty sozzled, you know. If there was a white line in the road, they would shut one eye and follow the white line, but it wasn't really, so you'd try and stay on the road, you know. <laughs> so when they went home and they went into the house and their wife or partner, whoever, would have the dinner laid out for them. So uh, sit down, eat the dinner, sit down in the chair and fall asleep. And that was them for the whole night. 
And then the wives, they would phone up the distillery manager the next day and say, this is not good enough. You know, my husband, all he does is come home and sleep. You're working him far too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom Rebullen, I think, was a, was a great sort of uh, grounding for me, if you like. Now, you've got Invergordon Distillery, who founded Tom Rebullen Distillery and took over Brochlade Distillery. So in 1973, uh, I got the chance to move to Isla, to Brochlade Distillery, to actually run it as what they called a working brewer, which was basically a charge hand and a charge hand who worked with the people as well. So you actually worked with people, you told them what to do. So it was good. I, I like doing that sort of thing. I like to be hands on. As most women will tell you, no, I never said that. <laughs> so anyway, I like to work away hands on. And it was in Brooklady from 1973 to 1977. You know, and again, that was, it was a great place, Isla. If anybody's been to Isla, you, you'll certainly go back. It's a really friendly place. Some people say it's sort of out of the way, you know. I mean, at that time, you didn't have a ferry on a Sunday in 1973. You didn't get your Sunday newspapers until Monday. Okay. Sorry? No, no, no. I, just, I wasn't aware of that. Go ahead and, sorry. Go ahead. Take another drink. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> so, yeah, Isla from 1973 to 1977. And then I saw the job uh, advertised at Springbank, you know, as distillery manager. Well, at that time, it was assistant manager because the guy, Roy Allen, was he hadn't retired yet. So I went across, went for an interview, got the job, moved across there and remained at Springbank until 1986. Now, at Springbank, I worked for a year as assistant manager. And then Roy Allen retired, so I took over as manager. Springbank was pretty quiet. If you come in, the same as the rest of the industry in the early 80s, there wasn't a lot happening, you know. So, um, But what they did do at Springbank is they bottled whiskey as well. So the bottling hall was extremely busy. So I was more involved with the bottling hall than anything else. There was a little production of Springbank in about 85, but apart from that, very little. So then that's me sitting there at Springbank and looking through the, the trade papers one day. Wait, wait, Frank, Frank can, I, can I stop you there a second? You, you mean that there was only production going on in one of those years? No, no, no. It was a couple of years, but that was the last year. Wow. 1985. Okay. There was very little production at that time. And I mean, the, the whole industry was pretty quiet at that time. Wow. Yeah, so, right after the big uh, crash. You know that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I looked through the trade papers and I saw the job at Bush Mills advertised. So I went across in 1986 and met a guy called Willie Mackay, another Scotsman. And his assistant, a guy called Dennis Higgins, and we sat down and talked about it. At the end of the day, I was offered a job, so I moved across there. And a lot of people asked me, why the hell did you go to Northern Ireland? You know, Northern Ireland at that time was, well, it was okay, you know, but it could be a bit, uh, a bit uh, not so nice areas you shouldn't visit, etc. So why did you go across there? And I always say to people, well, it's to further my knowledge, my education in the whiskey industry. But it really wasn't. I was paid more money. That's why I went, get more money. Come back to the money thing again. <laughs> so Bushmills was a, it, it was owned by Irish distillers at that time, and it subsequently then sold to Pernod Ricard, and then obviously to Diageo, but that was after I went away. Um, Bushmills, big distillery. At one point, we were doing 3.4 million litres of alcohol in a year, and that was really pushing it. That was when Pernod took over. They were way up to that. Perno wanted more production from Bush Mills, so they shortened Liz shortened the fermentation times to about 36 hours, believe it or not. So oh wow. It wasn't okay. Good the stills and the, the, the washbacks were still fermenting, you know. But anyway, that was another story. Yeah. So uh, one thing that I gained a lot of knowledge from at Bush Mills, working with a guy in Irish distillers called Brendan Monks, who worked at Middleton, was casks. And Brendan used to handle all the cask purchases, the bourbon cask, go to Spain, sherry casks. And uh, Antonia Pias Labato, that was the guy that supplied the sherry mm. cask, Jerez in southern Spain. So we did a lot with Brendan on the casks. And another thing that I used to get involved with was planning the actual production, a bit of that as well, because you sort of sit down, or the, the, the people who are going to do it sit down and decide they're going to sell so many cases of whiskey. Well, you've got to actually get production to suit that whiskey. So if it's 10 years old, you've got to make sure you've got, you know, enough. So you have to go away. You have to really lay down stock for the future. 
and you don't want to lay down too much, but you want to lay down enough to do that plus a percentage over it. So I learned quite a lot about that. It wasn't really nearly going in and making as much as you could and hope that it'll sell in the market in the future. It was really to make sure you got enough, but to make sure you could sell it. I think there's probably a bit too much of that these days. It's really people are going willy nilly producing spirit, maturing as whiskey, yeah. and where's it all going to be sold? You know. Uh, yeah. Frank, Frank, if you, I'm sorry, but so you were at Bush, or uh, Bushmills, during the '80s and early '90s. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stock that you're seeing bottled now at Teelings, mm -hmm. a lot of their older expressions that are winning awards, mm -hmm. it's actually your stuff. Could be. Yeah. I know I know the Gelstons. If you go way back the twenty five yeah. year old Gelstons, I mean that's that was Bush Mills distilled in nineteen ninety one, you know. So Yeah. I was there at that time. I wasn't physically doing the distillation, but I was in, in charge at that time. Yeah. Still though, I mean that's kinda cool. I mean a lot of that stuff that you made back then mm -hmm. is now winning big awards and mm -hmm. getting a lot of press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the Teeling's got uh, uh, best Irish whiskey on mm -hmm. some of those. I mean, yeah. and plus they've set records as the oldest Irish whiskeys yeah. Uh, yeah. ever yeah. released. Yeah. So, I'm yeah sorry. I, I was just over there last year and they were tasting this on some 28 year old stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it was good. Trials, maybe. I mean, it, it, it all depends a lot on the cask as well. I mean, you can make the best spirit, and if you put it in a cask, it's basically shit, you know, <laughs> but by French, you're, you're not going to end up with anything good. You've got to be really, really what you're doing with casks. I mean, if you go way back to probably the 60s or even before it or just after it, some of the casks were filled four or five times. You know, they weren't contributing hardly anything to the wood. You'd, uh, you certainly had uh, good access to really good sherry casks and amounts because a lot of the sherry came across to England, was bottled, and then you got the casks, you know. So, is yeah, there cask, cask is the thing. Is there not a lot of rejuve happening in Ireland? I don't then? know. Rejuvenation. Oh, okay. No, yeah. I honestly don't know. I mean, that's, that's a great way forward. I mean, it's gone on for a long time yet. It was sort of, uh, I don't know how many years ago started recharring. You're talking about recharring, cast rejuvenation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a good idea. I mean, I often think in the bourbon industry, you're only allowed to fill a cask once. It's got to be a new cask and all the rest of it, new wood. Why don't <laughs> change the law to rejuvenate some of these casks? And save the forests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know. Anyway, I suppose all to do with employment and labour laws as well. I don't know. Yep. Kind of a, simple as that. Well, how old were the? How long were they really aging a lot of whiskies in the sixties and seventies, both in Scotland and mm. in Ireland? I mean, mm -hmm. people weren't going for these really old whiskies. No. I mean, were they? They were. Didn't the older whiskies really come out of the fact that? You know, there's a slump in the whiskey industry, and uh, you had a lot of stock that was sitting there for long mm -hmm. periods of time. And then all of a sudden, they go, "Oh, look what we okay. thought found. ahead and made." Yes, the happy or found. Yeah, <laughs> found, it found, a, found it a dark corner of the warehouse. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, the single malt didn't really come into any great. Um, feeling for single malt until yeah, the late 60s, 70s. I mean, you've got like Glenn Fiddich, you know, a bit Macallan, you know, Glenn Grant, you know. Yeah. I remember working in a bar in Tom and Town, I shouldn't say this, but uh, there was three bottles left on the top shelf at the end of the season. And the proprietor said, you can take these away if you want. And one was banana rum. I tasted banana rum. I never tasted that. <laughs> Couldn't oh. drink it. One was a bottle of five, I shouldn't say this at all, hope Mr. Wright's not listening, five-year-old Springbank, which I also could drink. <laughs> it's one of the really old ones. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's different now. Yeah, people now see the value. I mean, Springbank bottled 90, what was it? 1919 Springbank bottled in 1970. 50-year-olds, you know. Oh, wow. There's, there's not many bottles of that to find. You pay about 40 grand for each one, you know. It was a Springbank 21-year-old back in the 90s that really turned me on to scotch as mm. opposed to bourbon. I was a bourbon drinker. Mm. And then, mm -hmm. oh, I thought that stuff was like, as a, an Irish friend once told me, it was like an angel pissing on my tongue. It was so good. Was that at the time you met the three wise men, was it? <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's a new definition of angel share, I guess. Like, yeah. <laughs> angel sharing it. It's an yeah. Sometimes they card. take it, but sometimes they give it back. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I got anyway, too much of it here. And anyway, to continue, what to yes, quite softly. It's, it's all right. I'll let you off this time. Uh, what was I going to say there? Yeah, continued working at Bush Mills until 1996. Come here. Sorry about that. Are I just have okay? to show you that. Oh! oh. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, oh. fluffy. So that's a rag doll. That's what it is. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Great looking cat. Yeah, it's all right. Right, <laughs> That's it. So Bush Mills up until 1996. Looks better than me, the cat. It's got more <laughs> You should wear it on your head, Frank. Yeah, it should be Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett with a raccoon, I can wear the rag. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 1996, uh, well, that time had been a long time in the whiskey industry, and my wife had this fancy to have a, a bed and breakfast establishment. So we looked into bed and breakfast establishments in a place called Bank Foot, which is just north of Perth in Scotland. And we saw this nice place, so we're pretty well settled. We'd go there, and that was it give up whiskey and go and do bed and breakfast. Never mind. I do some cold, you know, sometimes. Um, so almost at the point of leaving Bush Mills, I got a phone call one day. And I got a phone call from the chairman of Springbank, Janie Mitchell, a guy called Mr. Headley Wright. I don't know if anybody's heard of Headley Wright, a very famous person in the whiskey industry. He's the chairman. And he phoned me up and he said, Frank, and he never calls anybody their first name. It's usually Mr. Mr. whatever. So it was Frank. He says, um, do you, he was past some pleasantries, and then he said, do you know of any distillery managers that are looking for a job? And I said, well, not really. And anyway, I am leaving the industry. I'm going to wait to do bed and breakfast. You can't do that. You have to come back and work for us. So I did. So <laughs> I, I, got out, I got out of the bed and breakfast. Thank, thank Obviously God. very persuasive, man. <laughs> <laughs> So we went back really and... Really twisted uh, your arm there, Frank. Sorry? Really <laughs> twisted your arm. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I, how'd your wife take that? Oh, no, uh, she was happy enough because she quite liked Campbelltown. So, yeah. Oh, okay. There. So I've been there ever since. Um, Springbank, as you all know, and uh, is the only distillery in Scotland that carries out 100% of the whole process yeah. in the fact that it does the malting plus, obviously, all the production, all the warehousing, and then 100% of the bottling as well is carried out of Springbank. So it's a great place to work, you know. Anybody starting in the industry, which I wasn't, it's a great place to get a grounding and right through the whole thing. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we were pretty busy. The first year I went back, we made a lot of spirit. We did. And then we decided to cut back a little. And at the same time, Glen Scotia was coming back on stream. And a gal called John Peterson at Loch Lomond Distillers phoned me up again. People keep phoning me up, you know, <laughs> kept phoning me up and said, we're starting this place. Uh, we're looking for somebody to, to operate it. So our guys were, as you say, fairly quiet at that time. There was a, a, a bit of a takeout of the production at Springbank. We cut back a little bit. So they went over and started up in Scotia. And they worked there for three months, getting the place up and running. And we should, in Scotia, it's a nice distillery and produces a lovely product. But one thing we always say that we did there was slow the process right down. So the, the actual taking of spirit from the stills, uh, we slowed that right down. It's a, it's a fantastic spirit. Yeah. Great whiskey now, in Scotia. So we worked away at Springbank. And again, I told you about the cask laying down and uh, laying down casks for actual case sales. Did a lot of that as well, source casks. And mm -hmm. basically enjoyed myself. Played a lot of golf, badly. Played bowls, went fishing, bought a yacht. Wow. Of of <laughs> what? You bought a yacht? Yeah, yeah. I actually sailed to Norway with my yacht. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was good fun, good fun. B&B &B business. So up to 2013, 2013, I officially retired, 2013. I still did a little bit for Springbank in the fact that I did the whiskey school. I haven't done that for the last three years and uh, did special tours, things like this. People want me to show them around. Tour of Campbelltown, three distilleries, plus buffet, et cetera, plus warehouse tasting. It's good. So is uh, that, that's, that school, does that still happen? Yeah, or still operates, yeah, whiskey school, yeah. Okay. What? Well, what? Oh, go ahead, go, Marty. No, no, you go, Liz. 
Uh, I was just going to say, what did that school all in all entail? Because I've, I think we have some similar friends of ours in the in the U.S. here. I think attended yeah. it and had a lot of good yeah. things to say about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing about the Springbank Whiskey School. I mean, it's uh, three, three, four years since I did it, so I'm not really au fait, shall we say, with yeah. the up to date with what's happening just now. But I mean, it's a chance for the ordinary person with a bit of training to operate stills, do a bit of mashing, you know, under supervision. Yeah. But they can actually go and get their hands dirty. You know, hmm. they can empty this. They can empty the steep. They can fill the steep vaulting, turn the floors, get rid of the floors, etc. Look after the fire, empty the kiln. You know, nobody else really gets a chance to do that. So you're showing them the the unsexy parts of uh, mm. whiskey. Yeah, <laughs> like just yeah. so you know. This is what you're actually getting into. Other than the stills, is there really a sexy part? Then the the, the well, barrels, I mean, the, there's not a lot of sexy. Well, it depends. It depends. Work, it depends on the shape of the still. I mean, some of them are like that. Too, ah. so. Jim Murray, go watch it. You're you're right. Right. Never it. No, not no, worked. not going there. No, not going there. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, Frank, Frank, speaking of, uh, like I said, you have a, a far reach. As uh, as Liz mentioned, you uh, you uh, were a mentor to a, a number of guys. And I think we have a photo of one. Will, are you out there? Will, <laughs> I beckon thee. Um, there's uh, two brothers here in Illinois. Okay. Uh, Believe. Uh, the, uh, the beautiful Blum brothers. That is uh, a young... Uh, and felt uh, Mike Blum, yeah, uh, who, oh, is. Uh, yeah, and a fat who, Frank McCarty. No <laughs> yeah, boy, that doesn't look, that doesn't look like you at all. <laughs> no. uh, but yeah, that's uh, that was uh, Mike doing his uh, R and D mm-hmm. back in the day, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, he said he learned uh, a lot from you that mm-hmm. you were. Mm-hmm. Uh, that time he had over in Scotland was... Yeah, uh, I think a lot also doing the whiskey school, they learn a lot from the operators who are working with them. These are the guys yeah. with all the skill and they pass it on, you know, and it's, it's really it's really cool. As I say again, nobody else, as far as I know, in the Scottish whiskey industry treats people like that where they can actually go and touch things. I mean, you've got all health and safety now and they, they pay attention to health and safety at Springbank as well, but... It's sure. not really kosher to let people touch anything. They might burn themselves, do whatever. Liability. Liability, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what was it? Scott Talon says, ask about the resurrection of Glengyle Kilcarran. Yes. Kilcarran. That's hard for you to say, Kilcarran. Kilcarran. Yeah. Kilcarran. Kil- <laughs> fast and real angry. It sounds Scottish. <laughs> well, let's say Glengyle Distillery. I mean, it was lying derelict for a long time in Campbelltown. Uh, obviously, the distillery was up and running, uh, closed in 1925, and went through a series of, uh, of, of existences as a farm shop, as a, a cattle, making cattle feed through a mill. Oh, wow. And Mr. Wright, chairman at uh, Spring Bank, bought the whole site in the year 1999. In the year 2000, we were walking around the, the town, myself and a guy called Neil Clapperton, who is the uh, managing director at Springbank. And we came to Glengyle, and oh, yeah, that's Glengyle Distillery. That used to belong to my, this is Mr. Wright's great, 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 whatever uncle. He says, well, that was a distillery. Now, if I start this distillery up, that means there'll be three distilleries in Campbelltown. And as you probably know, you can't call a region a region unless there's at least three distilleries. So Mr. Wright's dream was to get Camelton back to be a region again. So he, he turned around to me, a bit tongue-in-cheek this, he says, uh, Mr. McCarty, that used to be a distillery owned by my blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you what, we'll get it up and running. Can you get it up and running, please? Right? So it took us four years, but eventually in 2004 it was opened up, you know. Um, with Mr. Wright and myself, we decided on the design of the distillery and what size it would be, etc. And it opened up in March 2004. My cat's up behind me now. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple of interesting things. I mean, Glengyle, I'm, I'm sure you know, the, the, the actual stills themselves came from Invergordon Distillery. Did you know that? Oh, no. You didn't? I know that, no. Oh, well, that's a bit of news for you. Right, there was a distillery at Invergordon, which was put in at the same time as I was in the Grain Distillery. It was a small malt distillery. 
operating there. It only operated for some six to seven years, and then it was mothballed. And that distillery was called Ben Wibbis. It's a mountain oh, a flat yeah, top yeah. near Invergordon yeah. called Ben Wibbis. So Ben Wibbis was there. It was mothballed. Uh, I remembered it was there, and we decided at the end of the day to go up and inspect the still house. And we ended up buying the stills, the condensers, the spirit receiver, pardon me, and uh, brought them all down to Springbank uh, to Glen Kyle and fitted them in. Now, we didn't like the shape of the stills. They had purifiers in the, in the line arms, they had purifiers, right? So we didn't like that. We wanted normal stills, just the thing. So we actually took the line arms and the purifiers off and put in new line arms and we sloped them slightly up the way. It's hard to see that. Sloped them slightly up today. Mm. It gives us a, a bit of reflux, etc. You know, yeah. Like, yeah, lighter spirit. Also, the top of the still to the body, to the pot, it was bolted. There was a bolt ran all the way around. So it's very much straight, straight, straight. You understand? It was all angles mm. and we didn't like yeah. that at all. So again, we took out the, we got for size with the main contractor. They altered the shape of the still slightly so they were more smooth, you know, so yeah. the vapor got a chance. We thought vapor got a chance to run up the still in a more orderly fashion, shall we say. Then in the condenser run to say. So the other thing we, we, we purchased as part of the whole thing was the spirit safe, which is a stainless steel spirit safe. And you won't see many of them about stainless steel. Right, okay. And we thought, this is a bloody awful thing. We're not wanting that, but we've left it there. And it's a bit of a talking point now. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of on the, sorry. Oh, I was just um, curious, when you were making all those changes, you know, mm -hmm. removing the purifier, changing mm -hmm. the line arm mm -hmm. um, angle, and kind of yep. smoothing out um, yep. the surface areas, did you were you doing a lot of trialing? I mean, what were some of the notes that were changing from previously to, to after all those modifications? I don't know if you can share any of that, but. Who knows? I mean, we, we didn't try all the stills the old way they were. We okay. Yeah. You're just like, this so isn't going to work. We altered, them to, <laughs> we altered them as we thought. Okay. You know? And yeah. we, the first production, uh, when the spirit started, or was almost starting to run, we were standing about like this, you know, what are we going to get here? You know, Mr. Wright, Chairman's there, Neil Clapperton's there, myself there, you know, and, and it was beautiful, so sweet, you know, it was really nice spirit, wholesome, sweet. So, you know, it's <laughs> genius. So, there's not, I, I know, Liz is all time. I mean, R and D and stuff like that. No, we'll just make it. <laughs> so, when you, this is one of the things I was interested in when, when I found out you were coming on because you've, um, I mean, I guess you've come in, you've you've picked up where things had left off, you you've started new distilleries. When you're starting a new distillery, how how do you get that idea of what the spirit's gonna be, or do you just take a shot and stand back and see what happens? I have almost almost I, I don't think it's that hard to make spirit, as I've said before, you know, if you've got the right equipment. I mean, you set up the stills to what you want them to produce. I would say, but you also get your malted barley peated or unpeated to suit the actual spirit you're going to get at the end of the day as well. You get your fermentations. How long do you want the fermentations? I mean, Springbank is quite famous for going up to 110 hours for a fermentation. And because oh, wow. of that, at the end of the day, they, they get a more fruity, a lighter fruity. Yeah. actual spirit, you know? And also, Liz, you know, the, the original gravities at Springbank are probably around 1050, 1047, 1050. And that okay. coupled with a long fermentation, you're only getting about mm. four and a half, five percent alcohol in the mm. wash, you know, which is pretty weak in comparison with eight or nine. Yeah. Oh. So anyway, yeah, setting that up, you, you take these things into account. You definitely do. Yeah, and like also also wooden washbacks, we swear by them as well. You know, mm -hmm. we do large boat skin large, large mm -hmm. washbacks. Not Oregon pine, sorry. <laughs> Not stainless <laughs> steel. <laughs> Sell a bee. Not, uh, yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Glen Gyle probably maximum production. If you worked at 365 days of the year, you'd get about 700, maybe 750,000 liters of alcohol, depending. Mm -hmm. Cats trying to buy in here, <laughs> trying to. Uh, we'll get the cat its own little square. Oh, she's uh, on there. She's 
Mm-hmm. She's off on her way. Uh, Frank, did you ever have any dealings over in Kentucky or over here in the States with American whiskey, or have you always just stayed over in Scotland? And Never, never been in America apart from doing promotional work, you know? That's it. I mean, I've been in New Orleans, Houston, Dallas, Austin, sure. uh, all over, but, obviously Los Angeles and San Francisco. But never involved in production? No, uh, no, no. I always found it interesting when going to either or that the Scots, there's a lot more, uh, as, as you were talking about the stills, there's a lot more uh, focus on the shape, the size, mm-hmm. really driving the quality. Mm-hmm. Where you don't hear that as much. I mean, down in Kentucky, it's yeah. it's, it's the East they talk about, mm-hmm. you know? Okay. Uh, I think that, yeah, the main difference, I think the main driver with that is we're talking batch distillation versus column distillation. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, column, it's not. Right, but not everyone's using column in Kentucky. It's, well, I, it's, it's true, but it. it, yeah, from a, a bourbon, the common. You know? um, yeah. Well, I always found that interesting because it is the shape of the still. I mean, you mm-hmm. have uh, almost any distillery will tell you about if they're the stills, the tallest, the the, yeah, the, fast, yeah. the, you know, the number of uh, onions they might have, you know, the reflex bulbs. Reflex surface areas, yep. yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're such a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> reflex surface areas. Yeah, yeah um, so you're talking about balls. Great, Marty. That's great. Bulbs, bulbs, not balls, bulbs. Oh, bulbs. Get your mind out of the gutter, Lewis. I did actually, um, I, I wanted to ask you a non-technical question. Oh, you mean Frank? Um, Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you've, you've got a, a, a pretty you know, big lineage I mean, with all the distilleries you've touched and, and um, startups, et cetera. What is maybe the, one of the things you learned really early in your career um, that was you know, sort of really important um, for you to get you on your journey that you could share for maybe younger distillers? Mm. Um, I think, the, as I've said, one of the, the main things uh, that I have found working with stills is to ensure that the spirit cuts are correct. You know, that's one of the most important things. And the actual, um, the actual running of the spirit, how quick, how slow it should be. Yep. And you've got to really decide on that. And the other really important things is the casks. You know, mm-hmm. I think that is really, a, you've got to make sure you've got good casks. Oh, the, cask, yeah. the cask, they reckon, is probably it's over 50% of the actual flavour in any whiskey is coming from the cask. So if the cask's not good, you're not going to have good whiskey. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Get off, cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's after <laughs> this. Oh. <laughs> anyway. well, you're doing a cat exorcism. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that these are two of the important things, you know, having worked in distilleries when I was a young guy, that's, that was one. The yeah, that was one of the things we, uh, we talked about during the sound check before, before the show, mm. um, that you don't really have a, a distilling degree. You've learned everything. You're a practical no. distiller. No, no, it's hands-on. Just, just yeah. Hands-on. yeah. And that, I mean, does that happen at all anymore? I think there's a lot of distillers who got to the giddy heights of where I am running distilleries. Quite a lot have gone through courses at Terrier, degrees at Harriet Watt, for instance, yeah. in Scotland, you know, come up with brewing distilling, as you know. Yeah. And that, that certainly it does do a lot for it. That's the way the industry is going, you know. Well, you know. That was the thing. That's what I was going to ask in our little earlier session was uh, uh, that was something I was picked up from some of the old timers at Diageo. Back in mm. the late '90s, Gordon mm. Bell and Evan Katnack, these guys all Evan, started. Right? That, right? Okay. Mm. Yeah, they all started at you know the bottom, mm-hmm. uh, just like you. All those different yeah. jobs yeah. they had around yeah. the distillery, which yeah. is, you know, you uh, for those uh, folks out there in the restaurant industry, that's what you always heard was yeah. the best way. You want to mm-hmm. start off as the busboy, yeah. work your yeah. way up to manager, yeah. so you know every you know you Everything. wash the dishes. But it was funny, those guys would walk around and, you know, then they started meeting the young Turks, the the new kids uh, mm-hmm. with the, uh, the smocks on and with the science degrees. 
and they'd uh, always kind of question, saying, oh, you're going to an awful lot of trouble. I mean, yes, taste it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all you need to know. Well, it's not bad. You know, and, you know, a couple of things here and there. But did uh, you ever feel that as times started changing and they started bringing in chemical engineers to do what you learned to do on the job? I think at the start, you thought, what's what's the good of this? You know, they're just, you know more than they do. They've you know, come from books and things like this. But as time goes on, you certainly can see the value of all these people. Definitely. Science is a big part of, of whiskey now and the actual production of it to the ensuring <laughs> that you get what you done. Put their glasses on. Yeah. Science. <laughs> it's, I, I know what you got. Well, I, I've got mine on, but I can't see what that is. Old school. No, no, I, I, yeah. I think science is, a, science is a big part to play in, in the production of any item, you know. And whiskey's no different. Our spirit yeah, is no different. I, I still think, yeah, to, I mean, to that point, like, practical piece of it is also incredibly important, as you know. So, I, I mean, it's it's balance, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've also got the people's perception of what goes on as well, you know. I mean, oh, yeah. if you've got an, an old distillery manager, they would believe a lot more than... He was telling you, man, shall we say, a younger one, you know. I didn't say female there, I said a younger one. It's <laughs> a nice you know fine I mean. line you walked but, there, Frank. That's really good. <laughs> but you've also got the visitors, the visitors thing as well. I mean, that's totally new. That's within the last 30, 40 years. Um, mm. Distilleries make a lot of money out of visitors, you know, and that promotes, obviously, whiskey as well. People get the chance yeah. to go and look at the stills and see what they produce, you know. Well, it, it, even with marketing, though, they still mm -hmm. show, it'll still be, you know, somebody walking with a Copita glass in through, a, 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 you know, the, the warehouse, trying, you know, dipping out the whiskey right out of the cask. And it's never a guy in a smock, you know, with a little pocket protector. No, no. About, you know, this no. whiskey. I don't have a pocket protector, Marty. <laughs> not, not today, you don't. Because you don't write anything down. It's all, did you, did you, did you? Yeah. It's all on the iPad. <laughs> so, have you actually have you actually been in a warehouse and, and taken whiskey or, from a cask? No. Me? Yeah. Yeah. I have. yeah. Oh, nice. With, with a, a bilinch. Yeah. 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 Okay. They used to do that for us. We would go to visit all the Diageo distilleries, and yeah. then obviously yeah. Bush Mills and yeah. uh, other distillery visits. I have a couple of bilinches myself, actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the, the Valinch, as they call it, there's a name in Scotland for a Valinch. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. Okay. You listening? No, he's gone. What is it? Where is he going? wandering off. A random warming. I think he's trying to find... Yeah. He's trying to find a prop. It, it, it's okay. He'll come back. <laughs> But you were saying, what yeah, is Yeah, I was the... saying that, uh, yeah, there is a, a special name for a blinch in Scotland. And any distillery people that are listening to me will probably know and say, oh, no, he's not going to say that. Is he? <laughs> and we, we in Scotland, it's known as a bull's prick. And you won't know what that is, but it's a bull's penis. <laughs> That's what we call it. You know? And all I can say is, lucky bulls. Here is, he's, he's, he's actually taken it out. Look. <laughs> Uh, that could have gone smoother. Yeah. <laughs> Got a great view of your butt, though, Marty. That was, um... Thank God, I, thank God I put pants on right before I came here. <laughs> so which bull did you get that from, huh? This one, <laughs> he one? doesn't know. <laughs> this, I got, this was a uh, gift to me from Vendome. This was oh, made right. at Vendome. Nice. Uh, but, uh, yes, for those kids out there who haven't seen one. Okay. Now they have. Yeah, thanks. Now I gotta repair the wall. <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, it's interesting too how you said. Uh, <laughs> actually, found it kind of funny. Your dad got you in the business because mm -hmm. you were basically hanging out, staying out all night drinking. What better place to uh, put you to work, but in a distillery? Yes, I know. I but that time. Little that weird philosophy, though. 
Yeah, but in the grain distillery at that time, didn't have the same mentality as the malt distillery. You know, oh. they got their drums, etc. No, <laughs> although although more, uh, more a factory. Uh, well, it is column stills. It's a bloody factory. I mean, I was a stillman, a stillman in a column still. You sit in a little office and you control the actual spirit, you know, coming off, and that's such a boring job if you're sitting there for twelve hours at a time doing that. No, not easy to stay awake in night shift. Mm, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, you know, we mentioned this, we talked about this briefly earlier as well. Um, uh, uh, my friend Jim Clark, uh, originally from Ireland, um, part of the Irish Whiskey Appreciation Society, you now a professor over in the UK, uh, wanted to talk about, wanted us to talk about uh, your experience with Dartmoor. Oh, I, mm -hmm. And everything you were doing and what you were telling us before was yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned about the still that you use. Yeah, yeah. It's an old cognac still, which was yeah. sourced, in, obviously, in cognac. And it belonged to a guy called Miguel Donjou. Miguel Donjou? Hard to say that. Miguel Donjou. Anyway, he's an old uh, cognac distilling family. And he had this old still lying in the corner of one of his, uh, one of his buildings. And the reason it was founders, the, one of the founders of Dartmoor, a guy called Greg, he goes a lot across to that area and he found out about it still and uh, came back and spoke to his friend called Simon Crow, who is a hotelier down in Dart near Dartmoor, and they decided they were going to start the distillery. So they brought all the distilling equipment across and Miguel came across and set them up. So they've, they've ended up with one of these cognac stills, if you understand, plus what they call a wash warmer plus a condenser. And they source their wash from a local brewery. No hops involved, mm. wash, yeah. because they do proper mashing. They source their barley locally, malted locally as well. Production is mm. very, very limited because the still is only, what is it, 1,200 litres in size. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what they do is, I don't know, have you seen a cognac still? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, you know, it comes yeah. out. The little pipe comes out the top, and it runs in. It runs <laughs> through a. I think they're very pretty. It runs through a thing which, like, shaped like a bell, which is a wash warmer, which helps, you know, etc. And then they've got the condenser, so they do three wash distillations. They collect low wines from that, then they clean out the still, get rid of all the crap that's in it, and put the low wines in there. And from that, they take spirit. It's not a very large still. No, it's tiny. Tiny. Oh, absolutely tiny. So Dartmoor tiny. itself is, I mean, their production would be how much annually? Oh, no. Now you're asking a question. I'm not sure. Off the top of my head. I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, they're only filling two or three casks a week. Oh, That's wow. It. So, oh, know, okay. it's very low. But again, they select casks. I mean, the, the first lot of casks, they've got bourbon, they've got sherry, they've got Bordeaux, etc., Madeira. So, you know. Yeah, they, no, you uh, you'll see them online. You'll see them on if you look at Facebook. You'll see them advertising all the time. You know, the first uh, stuff's coming out at the moment. Mm. So yeah, is that just mentioned that Scott Talon just mentioned that the oh, oh yeah, sixteen-year-old more sixteen-year-old being released. Oh no, he was talking about Karen. Never mind. Never no, mind. No, 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 no. Yes, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not keeping the flow here. No. <laughs> Um, I think it was about Dartmoor as well. They bought they bought the old town hall in a place called Bobby Tracy. That's where uh, that's, that's where right. they stay. And the town hall, they've, they've decked it out. It's a sort of meeting place as well, with the stills down at the end, the still down at the end, and a bit of glass wall in between, so the public can see it, but they can't touch anything. Mm. And down below the town hall is the old the, the jail, the old police cells, if you understand. Now, they, they haven't quite managed to attain them yet, but they're in the process of attaining them, and they'll probably warehouse some of the whiskey down in there in the cells, you know. <laughs> oh, being a marketing rush. But they bottle, they bottle as well. And I mean, it's not quite Keith Robinson, if you know what I mean, but they do bottle. They make a good job of it. Yeah. Is, the, is this uh, town hall still operational? Is this like where the, the town the mayor hangs uh, out? No, no, no. He's it's a good guy, by the way. The mayor is a really nice guy. <laughs> But uh, no, no, he's not. He doesn't hang out there. Apart from weekends and things, it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when the so still operating, yeah. So I would imagine that this is direct direct fire then. Direct fire by gas. Yeah. Yes, this. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, the, 
the spirit, I'm not sure the flow rate of the spirit, but it's tiny, you know, I mean, yeah. it's a tiny little pipe, you know, it's just nothing coming off it. And again, it's so sweet and so pure, etc. you know, no bad notes in it at all. And again, we didn't know what was going to come out of this, but then when we saw it, brilliant, you know, it's so I was now, there for the first distillation. Do they, uh, like a, uh, most cognac stills rest on a uh, brick oven? Yes, it is. Uh, the same thing here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, that was yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah. So I had a, qu I had a question um, around flavor, and this kind of segues um, my question for you, because Springbank right, also does uh, direct fire, but in your experience with indirect and direct fire, how much do you think that contributes to flavor, or do you think there's so many other things going on in the process that it doesn't necessarily? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's an awful lot of things going on, but at Springbank, they reckon with the direct fire and the wash still, you've got a slight charring effect, mm -hmm. and that charring effect is carried right through the spirit and ultimately the whiskey, but you're not aware of it. But if you took a sample of the actual low wines, shall we say, coming off, off the wash still with the direct firing, and you stop doing the direct firing, just use the internal steam coils, if you did a GC analysis, you'd find that some of the flavour spikes would disappear. So you've got to carry on doing it. I mean, I'll, yeah. I'll say again, a distillery manager, new distillery manager coming to Springbank, one of the first things he's told is don't change anything. <laughs> I mean, you could change it and make it more efficient and save money by not having this direct firing, you know, yeah. rather just use the steam coils. But you change it. So no way you're going to change it. So there must be something in the, in the direct firing and not direct firing as well. Yeah, that's contributing to the uh, flavor say, profile. Yeah. 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 Well, have you in all these years, uh, in all your experience, have you ever run across a distillery that did change something? Like there's a, the famous story of uh, Dalwini changed from a worm tub to a condenser and it completely changed their whiskey. No. So they went back to a worm tub. Yeah, any, I, I quite believe that too, because it would. Um, any of the distilleries I've worked at didn't change anything major right. like that like stills, like, you know, like condensers, right. like warm tubs, etc. I think Bushmills changed, I mean, years after you left, they uh, changed from uh, uh, wooden uh, washbacks to, uh, uh, mm. to uh, metal uh, stainless, kind of stainless, stainless steel, steel ones. Yeah, it would be stainless steel. You can get yeah. cortain lime steel, but it's, it's terrible stuff. It rusts, you know. Uh, stainless steel, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Whiskey uh, is a funny thing. What's all that small stuff? And What's I all mean, that? well, all the all the small changes. It's almost like there's a, I don't know, like an accumulation of all these little things into a, I don't know. It's, it's almost like chaos theory. Like you can't really pinpoint exactly what each of those little things is doing, but if you change one, yeah, you can yeah. taste it. Yeah. Oh, then they could all, yeah, they can all rely. It's it's like a Django, the game. Yeah. You know, yeah. you pull out one little box or something and affect something else. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised uh, I remember that. I played that again, one. Well, again, you're, yeah. you're talking about all these these different things. that can They can be uh, seen by analysis, Liz. Yeah. So, so now, I was going to say that. I was like, you can figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you have yeah. to be a nerd. <laughs> you have to be a science nerd. But to your, I mean, to your point, Frank, that's that's going back to you know tradition, right? I, I think mm -hmm. whiskey. Um, I mean, there's a lot of tradition specifically with mm -hmm. with Scotch as well, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. whole well, just don't change anything, then yeah. we don't have to worry about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but there is, yeah. you know, there's a. It's all right being traditional, but you've got to be efficient as well, and it's a yeah. sort of marrying yeah. of the two. You know, you don't yes. want to go all stainless steel and all the rest of it. You know what I mean? You've, well, you've got well, to present to the public uh, sort of face that uh, sure. that you're really traditional, but you're also very efficient. It's hard to do that sometimes. I had yeah. heard I had heard from uh, some folks who worked on the marketing side for Springbank that it was terribly difficult to uh, to market it because they couldn't keep up with demand. And that's mm. because they wanted to stay producing mm. how they produced, and they yeah. go, "You can't yeah. grow. You gotta, yeah. you gotta make some changes, yeah. or at least expand some way." But even mm. where that distillery is located in the town, 
Mm. I don't know how they could even expand their facility. Well, I mean, spring, it's, spring bank production, it's not full production. So you want to make more, that's it. Oh. But spring bank take the decision not to... More. Spring bank mm. taking the decision not to, to overproduce at the end of the day. I mean, there's no point in creating a whiskey lake when you can't sell it. It's, you know, if you create too much, and <laughs> the price is going to drop. I mean, well, Spring, bank, that, yeah. Spring bank, to my knowledge... No, I'm sure they don't. They don't yeah. go to duty free. Don't do duty no. free. Uh, no, I, mean, I think that was their point, though, is that they mm -hmm. wanted to grow. That the marketing folks, and these aren't you know, like New York marketing people. They were, mm -hmm. they were folks over in Scotland who worked directly for the company, and yeah. they wanted. They saw all these opportunities. Mm -hmm. but Springbank said, "No, nope, we want to. We like what we're doing. We like how much exactly. we're producing, and uh, exactly. that's all we're yeah. going to do." And, yeah. Same time though, I would love to have find if Frank, if you know anybody who still works there, you'd like to send me a bottle of the twenty one year old so I can reminisce. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of uh, enjoying um, some whiskey, what is everyone drinking today? I don't think we covered that Thir yet. Thirty two year old <laughs> North British bottled by Cadenheads. Wow, look at and you. That's I love really, those older oh, grins. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. They're wonderful. I yeah. am enjoying some vitamin water uh, produced by <laughs> Fitty Scent. Ooh. What? I, I think he founded this. I think it was Fitty Scent. <laughs> Don't correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, nope. I, was, I, was I, gonna, I was supposed to be leaving after this and driving, so I didn't want to drink. Oh, that's okay. it. I have, I'm, uh, just, uh, I'm just going next door to watch the telly. That's it. <laughs> I have a maker's uh, limited release. Dark. Oh, yes. In the spirit of uh, scotch and uh, Irish yeah. whiskey. Yeah, that's why I did that. Yep. <laughs> what about you, Lizard? Water. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, water, I have it. It. <laughs> it is the original water of life. I oh, mean, that's I mean, true. You're right there. You're actually in. At work. Yeah, right? I'm, I'm at a distillery at work, so oh, well. also yeah. being, being responsible here, Marty. Is that, a, is that a napkin dispenser back there? Are you in the break room? <laughs> yeah, <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> um, yes, okay. it is. We'll have to just start putting things in the background every show right. now. Just, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. to keep yeah. paying attention. Yeah. It'll be like a, a, an issue of Highlights Magazine. People can circle. <laughs> find the spoon. Find Ben Franklin's head. <laughs> I can't um, find the apple. Where's the apple? <laughs> I, I still want that magazine just for those. I used to love that. Um, and now, Frank, uh, what what are you doing now? You're in semi retirement, but semi. Like Rocky, you can always be pulled out of retirement for one last instead of match batch. Am I uh, correct here? So, what do you mean? I oh, you mean carry on consulting, whatever, whatever. Yeah, I mean someone can yeah. call you up and say, Frank, we need your help. Nobody yeah. else can help us. I'd <laughs> I don't mind passing on uh, an experience I've got, and if they want to listen to it, that's fine. You know, I don't mind helping anybody. Would I mean, you it's, help? It's basically, up? it's basically my hobby as well. You know, I'm very sad. My hobby is actually doing production <laughs> when I should be retired and <laughs> spend some of my money or whatever. But I'm Scottish, you know. I can't like, sleep at night. I can't sleep at night because the mattress is like that. You know. So. <laughs> That's like if Lou uh, were to retire from writing and just uh, spend all his time writing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I still I still do um, tastings, etc. Sweden, Sweden. I do quite a few tastings in Sweden. Oh wow! So cool. anywhere at all, I mean, it's fine. People pay me expenses to go and do it. Well, here, that's a, that's a good good question just popped up. How do you go, Lou? Um, uh, God, where am I? Uh, Christina Wolf. Sorry, these glasses are just not working. I'm going to take them off. Hang on. Uh, well, back to fermentation. It looks it's like Clark Kent. It's Superman. Right. <laughs> and it's like Clark Kent. It's my God. I didn't even know it. It was Lou Bryce. So she asks, some people swear by wooden tanks, other by stainless. What's your opinion? Microorganisms remain in the wood and influence the whole fermentation process and therefore the taste profile, or can you neglect that? 
Well, we always say it. Uh, we always have finished at Spig Bank now, but I always reckon that uh, you can't properly clean a wooden washback. So there are some of the microorganisms stick behind, even though the steam, Spig Bank, the steam, the washbacks for an hour. You know, or they did when oh. I was there. Oh. So I didn't kill everything off, and that could add something to the actual spirit. And I'll, I'll add on the, the stainless steel bit, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, carry on. Mm -hmm. Sterile I, environment, sterile. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the thing. It's back to the, you know, what's the intention of the, the final product? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. is it for uh, efficiency or is it for flavor? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's also the other consideration of open <laughs> open fermentations. So even if it is in a stainless steel vessel, if it's an open top fermenter, I mean, there's going to be, um, you know, I always talk about the, the microbiological terroir. <laughs> having a big effect as well. So if, if you have, you know, lactic acid bacteria, for example, that's hanging out in your stillhouse and you have an open mm -hmm. top fermenter, even though it's, yeah. you know, stainless, yeah. that could have an effect on the flavor. Yeah, so I think there's, a, yeah, quite a few things yeah. on with that well, question. Well, yeah, I mean, we talk about that with, with beer, with um, Belgian brewers all the time, because you've got mm -hmm. the, you've got the embedded microflora, you've got mm -hmm. the airborne, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because most of the stainless steel fermenters are closed, actually. So yeah, yeah. that is. I'm not. I'm not sure I've if it's an open one. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. seen both, at least here mm -hmm. in the the states. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. um, oh yeah, yeah. urban guys do stainless open. See, CO two is a big not a big problem, but it's something to consider with fermenters as well. You know, how do you control it? How do you get rid of oh. it? How do yeah. you keep it under under check? Well, it's, it's there anyway. You're not controlling it, but you have to do something with it. <laughs> I remember I worked out, I was going back a wee bit. I was at high at Berkladi Distillery at Berkladi, and the washbacks you had to go into the tun room if you like to open a valve to get the the wash to pump to the still house, and there was so much CO two in there you had to stand outside and go <sighs> hold the breath. And get, <laughs> run in and turn the valve and run out. Well, there was, a, there was a guy who forgot, and he almost made it back to the doors. When it, oof, and luckily enough, they pulled him out, but it's, it's pretty deadly stuff. But that was it. Hold the yeah. breath. And then they extended the handle to the top turn room where you could open the valve from up there, which was obviously the way to go. Well, there are stories. There are stories. Sorry, Liz, about guys. Sorry, going, yeah. sorry, going back to your point about cleaning fermenters, you know, washbacks, wooden washbacks at Brachlade. And the guy used to get in with a long shaft with heather tied round the end, and he would clean it with that. We thought they called wow. a heather besom, a heather brush. Wow. <laughs> that anyway, you were saying. Oh, I was going to say, there, there's been stories about guys who have collapsed and even drowned, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, from the CO2. Yeah. And I remember um, uh, calling me. Yeah. <laughs> calling me Ven when... Ventilation sensors, yeah. all important. Yeah. Safety yeah. first. Yeah. Well, I, I, well, well, we used to, sorry, in the, in the old days in the, in the fermenters, like the ones at Brachlady, you would light a candle and lower it down on a bit of, you know, a bit of tin to the bottom. And if the candle went out, you didn't yeah. go in. Oh, yeah. uh, or why not just send a canary? <laughs> well, that's cruel. <laughs> Candles are cheaper. No. <laughs> Canaries, dime a dozen at the store. That's a good, that's uh, a good point, Lou. <laughs> uh, you could... Uh, I think, uh, yeah, Cullum Egan uh, used to uh, get a big kick out of having people uh, smell the, uh, oh, yeah, the yeah. fermenters at, yeah, uh, yeah. at Bushmills. Yeah. And then eventually they put a lock on yeah. the doors yeah. so you can stick your head that's, in. That's, old, that's the old trick. You know, the wooden ones have got wooden sharp and lift it up and say, go and have a smell of that. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Like his back. It was, it was quite cruel, actually. What might be a root beer? Remind me of it as a kid when root beer would go up your nose. You yeah. ever get that? No, uh, I never no. tasted root beer. Ah, Frank, you haven't lived. You haven't really lived. <laughs> um, fun Sick fact about root beer. The flavor fact. profile of root beer is actually um, spearmint. Think about yeah, it. It's wintergreen, not wintergreen? Uh, yeah, wintergreen. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the correction. That's uh, okay. I read a piece about root beer way oh, early okay. in my career, and it stuck with me. It it ruined root beer for me. I think you, can, you can't okay. taste anything else after you know yeah, that. Yeah, you can't. Well, that, so, you're that welcome, everyone watching. Is that <laughs> what you're saying? 
is that present day? And here we're talking about something that Frank does has never even tried. Uh, but we'll talk about it later. Yeah, you yeah. yeah. there, and he's never but. tried root beer. Lou will send you. We can uh, we can talk about that at that year end show when it's just us yeah. again. Yeah, when we're doing the recap. If you, if you, if you send. If you send a 20 foot container containing your root <laughs> and some root beer. <laughs> so, uh, all right, going back to what you're doing now. What's uh, So you are doing some consulting if called upon, but mm -hmm. for the most part, you're kicking back, living the life yeah. of a uh, country oh, gentry yeah. kind yeah, of. Yeah. Well, yeah, just chat on you know. it doing not a lot, you know, but I still am connected, obviously, with Dartmoor. I've got them down there a couple of times a year. West Cork Distillers, I used to do a bit with them, not anymore. Oh. Uh, Whipper Snapper, you heard of them? Whipper Snapper Distillery in Perth, Western Australia. Oh, yes, I yeah. have. I, yeah, I no, did a bit yeah, with them, but uh, three weeks and keep in touch with them. I was out there for three weeks, but apart from that, just keep in touch with them, that's it. No? I would just think, I mean, there's been a number of guys, I know Charlie Smith, formerly of Talisker. He's still mm -hmm. out there uh, yeah. doing contract work, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, uh, it seems like a lot of guys are mm -hmm. over here. A lot of folks who've been in the industry, not even mm -hmm. that long, not even, uh, you know, tw may not even 20 years of leaving and finding that they could have a, yeah. a quite a career as a yeah. Yeah. Uh, consultant. Yeah. Well, I, to, I think one of the latest. Ah, yes. <laughs> it's like right above us here. Yes, I see her. Yes, yeah, very attractive consultant. That's not many are, but never mind. Jim anyway, Murray. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. That was a harmless. Was Jim paying you for all this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say to you the, the latest consultant I've heard of is a guy called Stuart Robertson, who is oh, sure, just yeah. finished with Dalmore Distillery. I mean, it was at Springbank and then Dalmore, so Stuart's setting himself up as a consultant as well. I'm not advertising for him, but a very able guy who knows the industry extremely well. Yeah, yeah Stuart, was, was it, I think Stuart was at Talisker way back in the day, back in the early aughts. Was he? Yeah, oh, I, yeah. So yeah. I think I have a couple of 20-year-old uh, bottles with his yeah. signature. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Very good, good. Yeah. No, there's a few. There's a, there's quite a few people that are doing this sort of thing. Uh, we may have to lose. Oh well, actually, I guess it's about time. Yeah, actually, me too. I've got a two thirty interview, unfortunately. Yeah, look, too. Oh, busy. busy <laughs> Gotta make a living, man. I had to cancel my trip. Um, okay. Yeah. Woo -woo. Yeah. All right. Okay. Don't forget these things. Right. Uh, Frank, it was so good chatting with you. Thanks yeah, so you much for coming funny. on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, nice to talk to you, all you guys and girls. Sorry. Yeah. Frank, for being uh, our guest, uh, you win prizes. You'll get a, a signed copy of Whiskey Masterclass by Lou Bryson. He will uh, sign it and uh, pay for the shipping. Will so, he? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> that's very, kind. <laughs> very kind of you. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna reach out to you and get your address, and you are gonna get your own set of uh, Glen Glen Karen, personalized Glencairn glasses with your name. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whiskey legend, it'll say whiskey legend on it. Um, it should. <laughs> and, uh, Liz is gonna make you up a big batch of root beer and send it. Oh, out right, to good. You. Oh, well done, Liz. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we'll we'll spike it. We'll spike it. <laughs> um, so uh, now next week, uh, and anybody who uh, hasn't had a chance, um, I believe there's a link for Frank down below. Um, so if you uh, would like to uh, reach out to him, I suppose you don't want just to answer questions. You want, you know, don't bother him unless it <laughs> got a little of this, and you're going to yeah, find. Yeah, I was going to say well. money. Yes, I'll listen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> None of this. All of a sudden, you oh, my herring aid. I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, a few coins in the meter. <laughs> and next week. Next we have, week, who do we have, Liz? We have Raj and the link. Um, <laughs> we have Raj. <laughs> See, uh, all right. The secret here is uh, Raj, we love you, but your last name is a mouthful. <laughs> Um, it's Raj Sabharwal. I think I've got it. 
Yeah. Uh, I doubt it. He'll, uh, he'll let us know next week how to pronounce it. Yes, yeah, so we'll know. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna uh, concentrate on the first fifteen minutes, just trying to figure out uh, how to pronounce that name. Uh, he's from Glass Revolution Imports. They, you know, you know, uh, Black Adder, um, Amarut, Indian Whiskey, and a number of other spirits. He's a great guy. Great guy. Uh, we'll have him there. Uh, until then, uh, Frank. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks again, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Toast with fifty cents finest. <laughs> Thanks, nice, everyone. Nice talking to you. Yeah. Okay. Bye, guys. Cheers. Bye. 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 <laughs>